Well, we've been in a series called Self-Inflicted, and Andrew concluded the series last weekend, and so I'm preaching what I call a standalone message about identity. So if you're taking notes, write down the title, Identity. And I want to talk about some of the identity issues that we all have, that we all experience at different times in our life, and this is because sometimes we have a mistaken identity, we think we're someone that we're not, we have a misplaced identity, we put our hope in something that was never intended to carry our hope, and there is a very real tactic and scheme of the enemy to rob you of your God-given birthright identity of being born again as a new creation, old is gone, new is come, walking in the fullness of the freedom of the joy that Jesus has for every single one of us called salvation. And there's an attack on every single one of our identity. And I want to talk to us today about that attack. And here's kind of what I mean when I say identity issues. Issue would be any problem, condition, past, problem, anything that you know yourself as being that does not align with God's holy word. It's any kind of issue that you carry and put in front of who you are in Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got issues. We've all got issues. We've all got issues. And the problem is some of us become so known as our issues, we're not known as followers of Christ. We become known as that divorcee, that bankrupt person, that mentally unwell person. We allow whatever the issue is to become at the forefront of who we are as opposed to son or daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I find sometimes in life, rather than dealing with our identity issue, we'd rather be pitied than healed. We'd rather have a whole bunch of people feeling sorry for us for where we are and why we are where we are, rather than doing the work that is required to work out the issues of the past and walk in the fullness of the freedom of the identity Jesus has for us in him. And so I want to help us today navigate some of those identity issues. I think a lot of us are walking around through life saying, I want to change the world, but we're not willing to change ourselves. And we've got to do some work in order to walk in the fullness of the identity that Jesus has for every single one of us. Now, I loved getting to name our children. Andrew and I have five-year-old twins. Their names are Justice and Adriana, and we agonized, we prayed, we asked God, we talked, we debated about what their names would be, and it was so fun to get to name Justice. Andrew is his middle name, named after my husband, Andrew, and so his name is Justice Andrew. He means strong, manly. We named him a real strong, good, manly name. And then Adriana, her name, Adriana Grace, is all about bringing hope and light and grace into the dark places of this world. We agonized and thought and prayerfully considered those names. Well, what's beautiful in my family, I'm a Nupiak Eskimo, and in the Nupiak tradition, the mother, my mother, also names the children. So my Babies have their American English names, Justice and Adriana, but my mom also named the children. And so their names in Inupiaq are Kipmik and Aktoyak, which is really confusing for toddlers. <laughs> They're a little, Aktoyak, come here right now. It's like, do you have something caught in your throat? What are you trying to say right there? But my kids have a dual identity. So they have their American English names, and they have their Native American, Alaska Native, Inupiaq Eskimo names. Every single one of us received a name. On earth, we all have an earthly identity, but we have a dual identity because we have a citizenship in heaven. And you may be called one thing on earth, but God calls you loved. God calls you chosen. God calls you favored. He calls you beloved. He calls you approves of you, accepts you, loves you, you. Every single one of us walk in a dual identity. And I want to talk today about this woman with an issue in the scriptures. I'm going to be reading from the book of Luke, but this story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Gospels. It's a story of a woman with the issue of blood. In fact, we don't even know her name. 
We only know her issue. How many of you are walking through life feeling like you're known for your issue, not for your name? This woman was known solely for her issue, a woman with the issue of blood. Now, what's interesting about this story, all three gospel accounts demonstrate this story is actually an interruption of another story. See, Jesus had just gotten off the boat, and Jairus had raced to Jesus and said, Jesus, I need help. I need help. I need you to come heal my 12-year-old daughter. Jesus gets off the boat. He's walking with Jairus, and Jairus is taking Jesus to the home where his 12-year-old daughter has fallen ill and is dying. Well, while Jesus is on his way with Jairus to this home, this woman with the issue of blood, interrupts Jesus. Isn't it good we serve a God who's always available for interruptions? This woman interrupts Jesus. He's on his way. Jairus is desperate. Jairus wants Jesus to go right to his home to help care for his 12-year-old daughter. And yet, Jesus gets interrupted by this woman with the issue of blood. And Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48 says... A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. Father, for your word for your deep love for every single one of us. God, I pray right now the words that are of me would fall to the floor. The words that are of you, Jesus, would pierce our hearts. And God, may we today allow the issues to fall away and our identity in you, Jesus, to become ever more paramount in every single one of our lives. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Here's the point I want us to understand today is that I can't reach my calling from my comfort zone. I can't reach my calling from my comfort zone. We all like a comfort zone. We all like the safety of whatever's comfortable. I would prefer to be sitting where you are right now. It's more comfortable to sit and listen than to stand on this platform and preach. We all prefer the comfort of doing and being and existing where there are no challenges, there are no hardships, there's no pressing through. When I was a kid, one of my favorite places to visit was called Homer. And I was born and raised in Alaska, and there's this place on the Homer Spit where I would love to sit. We would go and fish, and we would hang out, and I would watch all these big boats coming in for the day. In the morning, they would go out super early, like four in the morning, go out halibut fishing, and come back at the end of the day filled to the brim with massive halibut. And it was interesting watching all of these boats because the boat was safe in the harbor. And yet, that's not what the boat was intended for. The boat was safest in all of its day in the harbor. And yet, that boat would never see its purpose fulfilled if it never set sail on the open sea to see what the boat was capable of. In fact, one of the things that's interesting is when I was on the Homer Spit and I would look at all these boats, there was inevitably some boats that had deteriorated. And they were in shambles, sitting there, not used, and I would ask, why, why is this boat doing that? What happened to this boat? Well, the boat had stopped fulfilling its purpose. It had stopped being utilized. And when a boat was no longer being utilized, that boat began to deteriorate and fall apart and sit, only to collapse into the water. A boat is safe in the harbor, but that's not what the boat is intended for. Every single one of us will have to battle comfortability every single day of our lives. We all want to be comfortable. We all want to sit where it's safe. We all want to be in the harbor, but that's not what we were intended for. 
And it would be a miserable existence to live the entirety of our lives in the harbor, never setting sail and watching what God can do in and through our lives. We prefer the harbor, but that's not what we were intended for. The boat was actually strengthened by the waves tossing up against the side of the boat, that when the boat was out in the water, the challenge and the adversity of the storms of the existence of the boat actually strengthened the boat, allowing its purpose to be achieved and its purpose to be fully utilized. And how many of us today, rather than laying hold of our calling, rather than laying hold of our healing, rather than laying hold of what God has for every single one of us, we're sitting in the comfort of our harbor going, I like it here. It's safe here. I'd rather prefer to stay right here where I am. And Jesus is waiting, going, I have an entire adventure called life waiting for you. But you have to get out of the harbor. You have to trust me and watch and see what I can do in and through you. I can't reach my calling from my comfort zone. I have to get out of what is comfortable and set sail on the open sea to see what Jesus can do in and through me. And there's several valuable lessons I think we can learn from this woman with the issue of blood. First one is this. My history does not disqualify me from my destiny. My past is a great place for reference, but it's not a place for residence. I can learn from my past. I can grow from my past, but a past is not a place to live. The place to live is in the present, laying hold of the future and what Jesus has for every single one of us. My history does not disqualify me from my destiny. This woman, verse 43 and 44, says a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Just because things have always been one way doesn't mean I have to stay that way. This woman had endured 12 years. Now, I want you to understand a little bit about the time and place in history. You see, this woman, to be bleeding, this would be a uterine hemorrhage, which means she was bleeding for 12 years. That is 4,380 days. 4,380 days. Now, in this time and place in history, that would have warranted her as being labeled ceremonially unclean, which means she was unclean. Anyone she touched became unclean, so much so to the extent that if she touched a piece of furniture, that furniture became called unclean. Imagine living 4,380 days being labeled unclean all the days of your life. We don't even know her name. We know her as the woman with the issue of blood. She was classified as being unclean, which meant she would never get to attend synagogue. She'd never get to go to a worship service. She would never get to engage in a family gathering or a festival or a celebration of any kind. It meant this woman for 4,380 days sat in isolation, all alone, labeled, unclean, unworthy, rejected, and unwanted, cast out of society, never to be seen from or heard from again. This is the situation this woman finds herself in. And the scriptures say she sought care and no one could help her or heal her. Can you imagine 12 years of medical intervention and no one and nothing could help her? She only got worse. She had been known one way for 12 years and yet, She made a decision on this one day when Jairus and Jesus are on their way to Jairus' home, and she intercepts Jesus. She presses through the crowd, through the uncomfortability, through the challenge, through the hardship, to reach out, knowing if only she could touch Jesus, change was possible. Resistance is a powerful thing. I worked as a fitness instructor for seven years at LA Fitness, and one of the classes I taught was this class called Pilates, and I loved to use resistance bands. How many know what resistance bands are? Like a giant rubber band that you put on yourself to increase the resistance that helps us develop muscles. Well, 
I had this group of guys. They would come every single week to the Monday at 11 a.m. Pilates class. And this group of four or five guys, most of my classes were women, but this one group of four or five older guys, they loved Pilates. And every time I'd bring out the resistance bands, they'd go, oh, Christina, oh, this is awful. Why are you doing this to us? They hated it, which made me love it even more. And so I would watch every single person in my class put on these resistance bands, and we would do these exercises that would help them strengthen their existing muscles and develop the ones that didn't yet exist. As the fitness instructor, I knew it was good for them, and so I'd inflict some of this torture upon them. And I wonder how many of us are going through life looking at the challenges and the hardships of life as torture when really it was meant to strengthen us. We'll pray, take it from me, take it from me, when we should be praying, strengthen me, strengthen me. Changing the way we view our hardship, changing the way we view our issues, changing the way we view our challenges, and looking at it as an opportunity for strength to develop. Strengthening the faith muscles that are there and developing the muscles that don't yet exist. This woman presses through the crowd and does what no one else had done in order to lay hold of her healing. She knew she couldn't reach her calling from her comfort zone, so she pressed through the resistance. Number two, my support system is not my savior. My support system, while valuable, while wonderful, while great, it's not your savior. There's only one person who saves. Our support system is a great resource, but it is not our savior. There is no person on the planet, not a therapist, not a doctor, not a friend, not a parent, not a family member. There is not one person on the planet that can do for you what Jesus did for you. And we look to people before we look to the source. And we can never rely on a resource more than the source Jesus. My support system is great, but it is not my savior. Verse 44, verse 45 and 46. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Have you ever experienced an unexpected touch? Some friends and I, there's four of us, we were in Mexico and we were on a little holiday together, and I was in my first year of college, and we were having a great time, the four of us hanging out, and we were in a hotel room sound asleep when I experienced an unexpected touch. There was four of us in the room, two queen beds, two of us in each bed, and I'm sound asleep when all of a sudden I felt something brush against my face. And I woke up, and there was a man standing over me. Now, there is not much that will get your blood pumping quite like some stranger in another country standing over you. Now, I was sound asleep, woke up by this unexpected touch, when this man was reaching across me to grab my friend's camera, who she had gotten the prior year for a graduation present and was sitting on the nightstand, and we realized in the middle of the night we were being robbed. And I watched as I lay in bed, as I saw these three men moving about the room, going through our luggage, taking passports, taking what cash we had, taking whatever valuable belonging we had. And I laid there, waiting for my friends to wake up. <laughs> Surely they will save the day. Surely one of them will do something. Surely my support system will save the day. And I laid there for another minute, and I realized no one was doing anything. I had to do something. So I sat up in the bed, and loudly and boldly as I could, I shouted at the top of my lungs, get out, which woke up my friends. They were like, what is happening? And they saw the men in the room, and we all started shouting, get out, get out, get out. And these men, startled, took the belongings that they already had and began to run down the hall. My support system was wonderful, but they weren't going to help me in that moment. I had to do something about the situation rather than waiting for an opportunity to be saved. I had to take a moment to intervene and shout and do something. And I watched these men scurry down the hall, and fortunately, hotel security was able to help, and we got all of our belongings back. But it was a scary situation 
to wake up in the middle of the night experiencing an unexpected touch. Jesus is in a crowd of people, and he gets an unexpected touch. It's interesting because when Jesus is speaking and he says, who touched me? Peter says, master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. In other words, a gazillion people have touched you. And yet Jesus feels the touch of one. Now, we know when we look at the Gospels that it talks about the crowd being so strong, it was crushing. So this isn't just a light, gentle crowd like there's some people around. This is crushing. This crowd is so big and so great and kind of mob style that that it's pushing in against him. So he would have been touched by countless people. And yet Jesus says, who touched me? Because in the crowd, everybody was pressing in, but only one pressed in with expectation. In the crowd, everybody was touching, but only one touched with anticipation. In the crowd, everybody was there, everybody was apart, everybody was there, but only one had the belief and the faith and the hope that Jesus could actually do something in her situation. There was a big crowd, but there was only one with expectation and anticipation that she was going to touch the healer and that she would be healed. Jesus says, who touched me? A stitch of his clothing healed her. He didn't have to touch her. His clothing, it says she touched the hem of his garment, and yet just that allowed for her to experience healing. Whatever God does next in your life will emerge from what you're doing right now. And the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing you would have. And so often we'll try and manufacture something and we'll try and make something happen. We'll try and do something. And Jesus has the perfect timing. You think this woman wish she would have been healed in year one, year four, year seven? It took 12 years before she experienced her healing. Some of you, you're in this room and you're saying, Christina, I pressed in. I already tried that. I tried that once two years ago. I tried that three times five years ago. What if you tried one more time? What if you pressed in one more time? What if you believed one more time with an expectation, an anticipation for actual healing to occur? Number three, I am not my issues. I am not my issues. You see, the world would love to label you as your issues, would love to make you think, You are the sum culmination of what your issues are, your mistakes are. And I don't deny that there's issues, that there are mistakes, that there are hardships, that there are challenges. I've devoted my life to building God's church and to helping untangle and unravel the issues of our past. I teach psychology full time. I'm not discrediting what you are enduring mentally and emotionally but I am saying that there is a healer who can heal you in an instant and change the entire situation that you are neglecting to bring before the healer today. There is real healing. There is real freedom. I am not my issues. Some of us, it's singular. For some of us, most of us, it's plural. I am not my issues. Verse 47 says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. My issue is not my identity, and yet I will inevitably see the world as I am, not as it is. Part of the power of helping people understand mental health and emotional well-being is that I don't see the world as it is. I see the world as I am. And so if I'm an insecure person, every single thing that happens to me in life, I see through the lens of insecurity. If I'm an angry person, everything that happens around me, I see through the lens of anger. If I'm a bitter person, you get the idea that I see through the lens of as I am. And this woman, she comes before Jesus, trembling in fear, trembling. 
Why would she be trembling? Because she knows not only did she just make Jesus ceremonially unclean, she made every person in the crowd also ceremonially unclean unclean. She's trembling because she's anticipating rebuke. She's anticipating punishment. She's anticipating discipline. She's anticipating the same thing she's been getting for 12 years. And yet, Jesus welcomes her. A pointed finger harms an open hand heals. I've never seen any power released from a pointed finger. I've seen a lot of hurt, I've seen a lot of pain. I've seen a lot of further anger and anguish released from a pointed finger. And the enemy would love to remind you of your past, would love to make you feel small, would love to make you feel less than, would love to make you feel like your healing isn't possible. The pointed finger harms, the open hand heals. Jesus comes before every single one of us today with an open hand. He is more than capable to take on every single burden, every ounce of brokenness, every bit of shame, every bit of guilt, every bit of anguish. Our God is bigger, our God is greater, and he has love for every single part and place that you have tried to keep from him. That's the very place he's begging for you to invite him into. He loves, he's our savior. He loves you and wants to help you in that place. But we've gotta stop making what someone did to us bigger than what Jesus did for us. We build up that what people have done to us and we make it so much bigger than what Jesus did for us. When he went to that cross, it was with open hands, open palms that were there to heal us, to set us free, to help us walk in a renewed sense of power and purpose and identity. And I understand the anguish of pain. I get that. But you've already let them take so much time. Don't give them another day. If she had allowed them 12 years of isolation, 12 years of anguish, 12 years of judgment, she could have gone on the rest of her life like that, but she said, not anymore, not today. Today I press through the crowd. Today I don't allow my past to dictate my future. Today I ask Jesus for healing. Today I determine to get out of my comfort zone and to lay hold of my calling, to lay hold of my healing but the best way out is through. And so many of us are trying to do a workaround and we're trying to press fast forward. And the only way we experience healing is through the power of Jesus. There is no other way than through the power of Jesus. I'm gonna invite the team to come up and I wanna close with a couple thoughts. One of my favorite things that my grandmother said to me as a kid when I was kind of going through the hard time of being reminded of my past, but trying to walk in this new creation, this new authority, this new deliverance. And she said, Christina, if you don't like what people are saying about you, go so far you can't hear them anymore. And I thought, wow, Grandma, that's brilliant. I think sometimes we got to distance ourselves from the doubters. There are people that would love for you to stay exactly where you are. Why? Because misery loves company. But just because things have been one way doesn't mean they have to stay that way. we got to distance the doubters. How many other women maybe she sat in isolation with that wanted her to stay exactly where she was, exactly doing what she was doing, continuing to feel rejected and abandoned all the days of her life, and yet she left the place of isolation, pushed through the crowd in order to attain and receive her healing. See, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new has come. But it requires some work. It doesn't just happen. Jesus' power makes it possible, but we have to walk it out. When Andrew and I got married... We celebrate 19 years of marriage coming up here in a couple months. And greatest decision of my life outside of following Jesus was marrying my incredible husband. I could literally cry right now all of a sudden thinking, I'm whew, so thankful for my husband and our marriage. And 
<laughs> our first fight happened on our honeymoon as a married couple. Three days in, married life, and we're sitting at this wonderful Italian restaurant overlooking this beautiful water in Ocho Rios, Jamaica. We got married in Jamaica and honeymooned in Jamaica. And we're sitting there, and he said, well, you know, when we get back home and you change your name, I didn't hear anything he said after that. I said, hold up, what? He said, yeah, when we get back to Maryland, we were living in the D.C. area. When we get back to Maryland and you change your name, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who do you think you married? Which led to a really fun fight, which led to me realizing the amount of pride I had, thinking I was 23 years old when I got married. I thought I had accomplished so much I couldn't give up my name. So embarrassing now looking back. And Andrew gently and lovingly waited for me to finally succumb to the idea of changing my name. And now I'm so glad I did. My maiden name was Reasoner. Like, that's a hard name. Reasoner. Like, can you imagine? Like, my poor kids, that would be a hard name for them to pronounce. Guard is so much better. But I had to do some work. So I made the decision to change my name. Well, that decision was followed by some steps. I had to go to the Social Security Administration office. I had to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I had to change my credit cards. I had to change my registration on my vehicle. I had to change my insurance information. I changed my name with a decision. But I had to walk out some steps in order to take on the new identity. And some of us, you've gotten saved. You have the identity in Jesus Christ, but you haven't taken the steps to rid your old ways to rid the old life. And there is a new identity that Jesus has for every single one of us. And I want to encourage you today that Jesus is in the business of changing names. He's in the business. The old has gone. The new has come. We see throughout scripture where God literally renamed people. If you look in Genesis 17, 5, Abram becomes Abraham. Genesis 17, 15, Sarai becomes Sarah. Genesis 32, 38, Jacob, Israel, Acts 13, 9, Saul, Paul, John 1, Simon, Peter. We see throughout scripture, identities changing. Today, we get to walk in a new identity. Your issue is not your identity. One of the most beautiful parts of this entire passage is what Jesus did in response to the healing. You see, he says, who touched me? Now, if Jesus just wanted to heal her physically, he already did that. She got her physical healing. They could have kept moving. He could have kept it pushing back to Jairus' house. But he said, who touched me? Peter, there's so many people touching you, Jesus. Hello, look around. He says, who touched me? I know power left me. Now, why would Jesus want to bring attention to a woman who's been in isolation for 4,380 days? Why would Jesus, knowing the customs of the land and that she had just made everybody ceremonially unclean, why would he bring attention to her? What does Jesus say in response? Daughter. He calls her daughter. In front of everyone who had ostracized her, in front of everybody who had rejected her, in front of everybody who had judged her, in front of everybody who had made her feel small or less than, he calls her daughter. Jesus doesn't just care about your physical pain. He cares about your emotional pain as well. He wanted to make sure in that moment that, yes, you got her physical healing. But imagine the heartbreak of 4,380 days of isolation and loneliness and rejection. He invited her in and said, daughter. Her private pain became her public acceptance. And everybody that was there and watched and saw had to witness her identity change and transformation. Rejected became whole. Broken became healed. Unwanted became loved. Unknown became known. How many of us in this room today, it's time for a new identity. And Jesus says to you today, I call you son. I call you daughter. I call you loved. I called you accepted. I called you proved. I called you called. I called you known. This is the names that Jesus has for us. Stop entertaining the names of the world. You are not rejected. You are not unworthy. You are not unloved. You are not unwanted. Stop giving 
lip service and time to the names that people have called you. Today is a day we serve a God who's the breaker of chains, who's the restorer of broken identities. I don't care what the world has labeled you. You stand as a new creation, healed and whole by the power and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But you can't reach your calling from your comfort zone. And the tactic of the enemy is to make you continue to live as you have. When Jesus says today, bring me every broken part, bring me every unworthy part, and I won't just heal you physically, I will heal you emotionally as well.